Our next speaker is uh, Benjamin Nakhon from Berkeley, and he is talking about machine learning in the AGP. Great. Okay. Very good. I'll get started. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak, and I'm really sorry I can't be there with you all um, today. So I'll talk about um, machine learning, and I'll give um, a broad overview. Um, now, uh, I want to start by sort of setting the scene for uh, how I uh, view what we do in high energy physics and sort of there's these two parallel paths. There's the theory path on the left, the experimental path on the right. The ultimate goal, of course, is to first infer something about nature and in order to do so determine sort of our theory of everything. Um, on the left hand side, we have a forward model. As I say, we can simulate nature given by some Lagrangian and then we can um, build experiments to make observations comparing the two and hopefully do some inference. Uh, machine learning is playing uh, a role, in some cases a critical role, in nearly all aspects of this um, pipeline, both on the theory side and on the experimental side, um, all the way from experimental design to control um, to data processing offline, and then on the theory side for accelerating slow simulations and doing inference. Okay, now I don't have time uh, in the allocation I've been given to go over every aspect of machine learning for high energy physics um, across the various um, domains um, that our field is composed of. So instead, I thought I would pick three topics and try to cover them in a little bit more detail to give you a sense of the of the breadth. And then I'm very happy to say more um, later. Okay, um, so I'm going to start um, with this um, bottom right hand part here, which says data curation, which is sort of a catch all word for many things. Um, and uh, 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 data curation can include all aspects of reconstruction from calibration, clustering, noise mitigation, particle identification, et cetera, et cetera. This is to a large extent where most of machine learning has been applied um, so far. Um, and the very first task that we have to do is understand how to represent our data. Um, high energy physics data are very complex and there are many different ways that we could represent them. Um, for instance, we could imagine representing our data from a number, taking a number of um, four vectors or fixed features, and then applying some uh, network, neural network or other machine learning um, algorithm appropriate for a fixed set of, of inputs. Um, but if we represent instead our data as variable sets or images or sequences or trees or graphs, then for each uh, representation, there's a corresponding natural um, machine learning architecture or architectures that can be applied. So let me walk you through a little bit about how that goes. First, let me talk with, uh, start with images, um, which to a large extent has driven the deep learning revolution in industry um, and uh, correspondingly has made an impact on energy physics. Uh, so uh, some of our experiments, the data are naturally represented as images. Some of them require some, some tweaking. So let's say you have a collider, um, you know, um, image, uh, a collider event like the one shown here. Um, you can imagine um, projecting the energy out of the surface of a cylinder um, and then thinking about the um, energy deposited in a given um, location as sort of the pixel intensity of a grayscale image. Um, and if you have multiple detector elements, say like different calorimeters or say a tracker and a calorimeter or different other, or other modalities, then you can imagine having say like a color image where you have like say red, green, and blue images where the pixel intensity um, is say the energy deposited in a given um, detector component. Um, so you can imagine having some kind of global uh, event information, and then you could also imagine regions of interest like jets or other um, localized features, depending on the um, experiment. Um, and then um, you can imagine taking processing those images using, say, state-of-the-art deep neural networks, for instance, using convolutional neural networks. And there are some complexities we have to keep in mind. For instance, our data, like I said, are complex, so they that includes uh, the fact that they often represent uh, a respect of various symmetries. In this case, there's a clear symmetry, rotational symmetry. Um, and so these are images, I've shown them here as you know, two-dimensional unrolled um, squares, but in practice, of course, the left-hand side and the right-hand side or the bottom and the top, however you like to look at it, are, are actually the same. And it's something we have to tell um, the machine learning algorithm about. Um, but in any case, one could train um, uh, approaches to be able to distinguish, let's say, different kinds of events from each other. Okay, so that's, that's images. Um, now, uh, images, of course, are very natural in many cases, but in some cases, they are not the most natural. And one key challenge is with images is that they have a fixed set of, of inputs. Uh, in many contexts, this is good because the data have that structure, 
Um, however, it's not always the case. So for instance, like imagine you have an event with a variable number of outgoing particles. And if there's a variable number, then it's not necessarily um, well matched to an image. So I'm going to represent instead these particles as a sequence in order to apply variable length approaches that have been um, pioneered in natural language processing um, to have access to the full feature granularity. Um, so one example of how this has been done um, already in the context of uh, what are called recurrent neural networks. Um, so it's like a convolutional neural network. A convolutional neural network applies across uh, an image, and a recurrent neural network ap applies a, um, a module across sequence. Um, and you would imagine ordering, say, all the particles inside some hadronic jet to do flavor tagging. And um, you can see here how this would work. Let's see, you have a bunch of charged particle trajectories inside this jet, and then this um, RNN basically applies um, to each track one at a time, taking as input the previous output um, and then processing one track at a time. And so in this way, it can, it can process a variable length um, arbitrarily long sequences. Okay, um, there are also hybrids between convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. So here's a relatively sophisticated neural network architecture used by the CMS experiment um, that processes um, all the particles um, for flavor tagging where you can process the individual um, charged particles, neutral particles, vertex information. And there's first some dimensionality reduction done with the convolutional neural network. And then because there's a variable number of inputs, you can imagine doing a recurrent neural network on top of that. OK, and the gains are, are really significant over classical methods. OK, um, next I will talk about variable sets. So a challenge with sequence learning is that um, thanks to quantum mechanics, often uh, our particles or other objects come to us with no unique order. So I could order, I could always impose an order like energy ordered, um, but that's um, not not unique. Um, so a common scenario is that we have a variable length set. Um, so set in the sense that the, I can permute the the um, the constituents. And so here you can imagine using set learning, and there are a number of strategies. One of which is called deep sets, and the idea is to factorize the problem into two neural networks. One that embeds your um, set elements into some latent space, an abstract vector space, and then another uh, operation that acts on the sum of the latent space vectors. And sums are permutation invariant that can naturally accommodate variable length. And so in this way, you can construct um, what's probably universal for variable length set learning. Um, and uh, that's sort of shown, shown schematically here. And um, here um, pictorially. So imagine you have a bunch of particles. Each of those particles has some features, so like the four vector and additional information. There's this final network that embeds them into some abstract space. You can sum all the abstract latent vectors. And you have another um, neural network that processes the sum. Um, and here is a picture that shows, um, as a function of the abstract um, latent vector space dimension, the performance on the y-axis. So a higher is better. This um, metric is called area under the curve. Um, it goes between 0.5 and 1. 1 is the best, 0.5 is the worst. And um, what these different colors correspond to is adding additional information. So these different neural network architectures can, uh, are, can easily accommodate additional information per particle. And the, the upstairs of the more information you add, the better they are. Um, and there are some interesting physics constraints you can impose to make these um, neural networks more robust and um, um, uh, interpretable. In fact, this totally crazy picture I'm showing here corresponds to the um, structure of the latent space for a particular configuration uh, in which the size of these crazy looking filters actually can be predicted from QCD, uh, amazingly. OK, um, there are also advantages to, say, deep sets over other methods in the context of, say, RNNs, which are also variable length, um, uh, in, in that they're faster to train. So this can actually um, reduce the, the, reduce the um, R&D cycle and therefore um, increase performance. So here's a nice picture that shows um, the performance of flavor tagging in Atlas as a function of the jet energy and higher is better. Um, the purple and green have, are basically the same. This is an RNN versus a deep sets approach, but because it's so much faster, the deep sets approach, it's, it was a, they were able to optimize and, and therefore um, increase the performance quite a bit. All right, um, there are other approaches. In, so. Um, Deep sets acts on point clouds and doesn't know about geometry, um, but you can uh, you can uh, use information about the distances between inputs, um, for instance, as a graph um, to apply a graph neural network, which is sort of like a convolutional neural network, except that it's not a fixed grid. So you can imagine having any adjacency matrix where you can have um, your nodes connected with edges, and then you can have the edges be um, connect any any of the nodes together and apply what's basically a convolution operator. Um, to the graph. And um, 
uh, yeah, this uh, also um, works very well and um, uh, has competitive, basically state-of-the-art performance in a number of tasks. Um, here, um, here's the in the context of um, tagging the uh, presence of a, a, a highly uh, Lorentz boosted top quark um, versus genetic quark and gluon jets. Okay, um, so that's my whirlwind tour of representations. And then the other task that's involved with constructing a neural network uh, and training it, um, or the machine learning algorithm, is, is how to how to supervise it. Um, so most machine learning algorithms that you've probably heard about are supervised. So you have examples, they like pictures of cats and dogs, and I know which pictures are cats, which pictures are dogs. I train my, say, convolutional neural network to distinguish the pictures, and that's um, how it works. Uh, and that's also true in high energy physics. So we have simulations, say, of signal in the background, you're trying to classify or distinguish a signal from the background. But there are a number of alternatives that use um, uh, less information. Um, unsupervised machine learning uses no uh, label information whatsoever. And I'll give you some examples of all these in just a second. OK. So yeah, most of the machine learning that we do is supervised. So we have labeled examples. This is an advantage of having simulations. In simulation, you know what signal you know its background, so you can just train a classifier to distinguish them. Um, there's some subtleties about how to do that training um, in the context of a loss function, which I'll say a bit more about in a second. OK, so unsupervised is the other extreme. You have no labels. And typically, the goal of these methods is to learn implicitly or explicitly the density of the data, p of x. Um, so just to give you an example, one strategy is called an autoencoder. And it takes some, some data, for instance, like an image. This is like a pixelated image on the left-hand side. It learns an encoder and a decoder, so two, two neural networks. And they're trained such that when you encode and decode, you're very close to what you started with. Um, so this is the context in which it's unsupervised. I don't know if it's signal or background. I just know, is it close to what I started with? And um, clearly, if this um, uh, encoder decoder structure is doing its job properly, then it should assign more capacity to more common examples. and less capacity to less common examples. And so implicitly, it's learning something like the density um, uh, uh, when there's a bottleneck here. So it can't just learn the identity. OK. Then there's weakly supervised learning. And here you have labels for every example, but they're noisy. Uh, and so typically, uh, the context of these is that you have, say, two data sets, um, which are each mixed samples of your two classes. So I have some one data set that's some signal, some background, the other that's also some signal, some background with different ratio. And so I can assign a noisy label of, of signal to the signal enriched sample and a noisy label of background to the signal depleted sample. And then I can proceed with you know, machine learning in that way. And there uh, actually turns out you can do a lot of um, really optimal um, learning in, in this noisy context. And the last is semi supervised, where you have some partial labels. So typically, these methods use some signal simulations, as well as some, say, like control region data where you don't have labels. Um, but it's probably mostly background or a single single process. And so you might imagine training, say, um, a classifier to distinguish some concoction of signal models against some control region, um, mostly background data, uh, in order to, to attain some sort of model agnostic sensitivity to a bunch of different signals. OK, um, there are some cautionary tales that are involved in this, which I'll um, very briefly say as an aside. So um, when we train these classifiers, often it's not good enough just to train them um, uh, in an uncontrolled way. Um, so um, for instance, let's say you're doing like a bump hunt, where you have a number of features that you can use for classification, and then one you're going to do a bump hunt with. So on the left-hand side, you might have like some steeply falling background for you know the normal case. And you train a classifier using a bunch of other features you apply a cut, and ideally you make the cut and it's still steeply falling. Um, but in reality, what happens is that the classifier is smart. It can learn about correlations between the feature you, you're, you're, you're bump hunting on and your other features, and it can sculpt bumps. So the, the you know, background only case can still make bumps. So there are a number of strategies to do to get around this, um, basically to train classifiers that are independent of the resonant feature. Um, and um, the way that people usually do this is that, um, you, you modify your loss function. So you have like a typical loss function um, where um, uh, you have, um, say, a penalty for having your signal close to you know, predicting, say, one, and your background close to predicting, say, zero. And then we add an additional penalty term that tries to ensure that the classifier can't learn the resonant feature indirectly. Um, and there are a number of possibilities for this decorrelation term. And this lambda here, you can think of like a Lagrange multiplier. So, it's sort of like a trade-off between how, how much you care about classification performance and how much you care about this decorrelation. The number of proposals, um, I'm just going to like go through them super quickly. One is, it, is to have this 
um, basically train another neural network simultaneously that tries to predict the resonant feature from the classifier. If it can't, then you're doing a good job of decorrelating. Um, the other is to essentially impose just the correlation, compute the correlation between the, um, the classifier output and the resonant feature. And if their correlation is small, that's good. Um, people tend to not use the actual correlation because it's, you know, it only captures linear dependencies. And so there's this notion of distance correlation that generalizes the normal correlation they are used to, um, where um, uh, basically it's zero if and only if they're actually independent. Um, otherwise it has some non-zero non value. Um, and then you could try to impose um, uh, explicitly that the that the the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the neural network output is the same across different values of the resonant feature. Um, this is, so these are three possible examples and they have pros and cons. So adversaries are great because you want a second neural network. It's very flexible, can easily be multidimensional, but it, you know it's just another neural network. So it has lots of parameters and it's hard to train. Um, distance correlation, it's convex. So easier to train, it's just a single quantity that you can just compute as a formula. Um, so no free parameters, uh, but it can be um, computationally challenging. And this last one readily generalizes to going beyond independence. Um, it also has no free parameters, but um, it requires um, typically some binning, um, so some discretization effects. Okay, here just showing how this works in practice. The left-hand side is the usual, usual. This is actually signal versus background. Um, so there's like this is like boosted W boson tagging where background is steeply falling, signal is peaked around 80 GeV W boson mass. And the right-hand side is you train a bunch of classifiers, background only. So if you just train a classifier naively using a bunch of features of the jets and you make a cut, you get the black histogram. So it looks just like the signal, but there's no signal. That's bad. Can't fit, can't fit a bump on top of a bump. And the other lines here all correspond to various versions of decorrelation, and they all work to varying degrees. Um, and you can see they're all fittable after applying a cut on their classifier. Okay, um, the other thing I'll quickly say is about prior dependence. So sometimes we need uh, a model um, that does not depend on the training sample property. So the example I like to say is if you have, let's say, uh, um, a particle of a given energy um, that hits our detector and reg registers some measurements, you want to, let's say, predict the true energy given the measurements. And we want, uh, let, it's typically the case that we, we train this regression model, like a uniform distribution of energies. Um, but in practice, often the data are like power law, steeply falling. And so we want it to still be true, be accurate in that case. Um, and so, you know, if your instinct was to train a classifier regression model to predict the true energy from the measured energies, um, that's what most people think about doing. And um, I claim that it's biased um, in the sense that it's prior dependent. And I'll just quickly say how that why that's the case. So suppose you have, you know, some measured features, some true features, um, x and y, and the typical thing to do is to train a neural network, um, f and g are neural networks, um, to predict the true given the measured. And if you do this, then um, uh, you can show that um, asymptotically your regression model will predict the average value of the true energy given the measured energy. And that can be a problem. These are just sorry, these are the most equations I'm going to show in the whole talk. The first one is just the definition of the average value. And the second line, I'm just plugging in the first line. And the point is that um, if you compute the average value of the, um, of the, of the calibrated energy, um, given the true energy, it's not necessarily the true energy. So ideally the you know, calibrated energy of measured given true would be true. That means it's unbiased, um, but it's not the case because there's some prior dependence. Um, here's just a simple example of how that works. So say you have measured and true, they're both Gaussians, simple, simplest possible case. Um, and um, you can imagine, so here, it's just like a linear regression problem. Um, so you can predict true as a function of measured, and then bins of true, if you plot the measured, you get a calibration curve that's not one to one. Um, and there are ways around this using machine learning, other alternative machine learning methods. So for instance, maximum likelihood estimation, which is the red, um, is prior independent and can be used as an alternative. Um, and there are other approaches that might work as well. Okay. So that was my Super Bowl run tour to this um, bottom right hand side of the of the uh, puzzle. And now I want to give a little bit of information about the other um, some other components. So now I'm going to go to fast simulation that is building um, uh, sur what are called surrogate models. So fast approximations to slow detector simulations and other simulations. OK, um, so the question is, can we train a neural network to emulate, say, a, a simulation? It can be a detector simulation or some other simulation? I'm going to use detector simulation as my example because um, detector simulation can be very slow. So they're in great need of acceleration. And just like the images I mentioned earlier, you can imagine a picture like this. It's a grayscale image 
where the pixel intensity could correspond to the energy deposited in a particular region of the detector. Um, and uh, what is a generator in this context? A generator is nothing other than a map um, from random numbers to structure. Um, and so it's shown schematically here. And a deep generative model, say a neural network in this context, is nothing other than a case where this map is a neural network. Um, and so the map is deterministic. So if I'm going to have a stochastic generator, but the stochasticity comes from the random inputs, not the function itself. Um, there are four standard deep generative models that people are really excited about. Generative adversarial networks, normalizing flows, variation autoencoders, and then um, some combination of score-based or diffusion models, which are the latest on the market. OK, so uh, I'm just going to quickly explain how these all work. Um, for a GAN generative adversarial network, it's constructed by training two neural networks. One that generates you know, maps noise to structure, and the second neural network that distinguishes the um, generated examples from real examples, and they kind of compete. When the discriminator second neural network is confused, then the generator is doing a very good job, and you forget about the discriminator and just keep the generator. Variational autoencoders are a variation of the autoencoder I mentioned earlier. So you have a compression model and then a um, decompression model. Um, and the only difference in what I said earlier is that um, they're both uh, probabilistic. So, so that um, once you've trained this autoencoder, then um, you can um, use the decoder as a generative model. And lastly, there's normalizing flows. And um, normalizing flow, you start from some uh, latent space, you apply a series of invertible transformations. And at the end, you can just use the usual change of probability rule um, to get the density. So you have some initial density, usually it's like the Gaussian, and you map it through and you get some complicated density, and you can use maximum likelihood to train um, this function. Uh, and score-based models are sort of the latest in the game, and uh, they learn instead of the density, they learn the log of the density, or they learn the, the gradient of the density, which is called the score. And there are a number of reasons why learning the score can be um, uh, uh, superior to learning the density itself. And one way of training these is with the diffusion model, where you basically smear the data until it matches the Gaussian, and you can solve the stochastic differential equation um, to invert it. OK, and as I say, these, all these models have been used for calorimeter simulation or slow detector simulation in general. Um, you can see here, this is the context of calorimeter simulation, which is often the slowest part of a simulation stack. There's GANs, VAEs, normalizing flows, and diffusion models. And they all seem to work very well and can scale to very high dimensions. Um, uh, and here is just, yeah, this is this, um, the field histograms in the top left show one example. This is just the guts of one of these neural networks that generates a multi layer color emitter um, using a generative adversarial network. This is just the, the picture of the generator where you input the particle energy, so it's conditional energy and some, some random noise um, pass through a, a series of uh, blocks that are like convolutional neural networks, and then they are output three, say, three images, one for each layer. Um, there are a lot of uh, interesting features that you can use these uh, neural networks for. So um, because uh, you, you fix, say, like the, um, uh, they're like deterministic functions, you can imagine varying the inputs and seeing how that varies the outputs. So in, in this um, top picture here, um, uh, we're scanning the energy. So you fix the noise and just change the energy. And you can see without changing, basically we're fixing all the random numbers, so all the Monte Carlo statistical uncertainty, if you like, you can see how an image would change if you change its energy. And more or less what happens is the shower gets deeper and there's more energy deposited. And the bottom picture showed what happens if instead of changing the energy, you change the location of the shower um, and the, you know, the, blob will move, the blob moves from the top to the bottom in the various pictures. OK, um, I'm pretty excited to say that actually this is not just something that's been studied in principle and practice, it's starting to be used. Um, here's a schematic diagram of the ATLAS uh, experiment detector simulation. Um, you can see different subsystems on the top, different particles on the, right, on the left, and the middle are what's being used. And for intermediate energy pylons in the calorimeter, actually a, a GAN is being used um, to generate something like a billion um, showers in the next um, uh, round of simulations. Um, here's to show that it works pretty well. This is the average energy as a function of the pseudo rapidity. Um, and yeah, the, the GAN. Um, uh, uh, reproduces j 4 um, pretty well, and it improves the performance in a number of areas. So the top left is the number of constituents inside jets, and the bottom right is the mass of jets. And the point is that uh, AF3 is the new one. It uses this scan as part of its um, uh, simulation compared to the old one in blue, and the, the red is closer to the black than is the blue, which is great. Um, 
uh, it's also fast. So it's just to say that evaluating a neural network is independent of, of the energy, um, so it should be flat. Whereas Jan4 scales, with, you know, it takes longer the higher the energy it is. Okay, um, one small caveat about all this is that um, uh, we have to be careful about um, uh, oversampling. So if you train on n events and you want to sample m much bigger than n events, do we have the statistical power of m or n? And it turns out that actually um, you, you can have a statistical power which is more than n, which is great. And it comes from inductive bias. It comes from the fact that um, we impose information, um, if nothing else, from the fact that you know physics simulate physics um, densities tend to be smooth as our neural networks. Um, and this is just a, a picture that shows how this works out in practice that um, uh, uh, um, basically a sample that's been trained with a GAN um, can can actually um, uh, be better than what you might expect from just the starting sample size. You can oversample and, and actually achieve statistical amplification. All right, um, so in the last part of my talk, I'm going to try to say something about um, parameter estimation. Um, and unfolding, so the inverse direction. And this is a huge subject, and I'm basically not going to touch parameter estimation at all. I'm only going to talk about unfolding, which is a, a sort of inference task where we're trying to invert uh, one of the you know, uh, inference tasks, we're trying to invert um, simulations. Okay, so the unfolding problem is that we um, measure some detector signatures um, and we want to remove detector distortions and infer what the particles look like before they were distorted by our detectors. Um, so this is called unfolding, and um, what you might think about doing is if I could write down the likelihood, the probability of measured given true, I would say, well, my unfolded result is the true that maximizes the likelihood. Um, and that would be great, but the problem is that we want to measure high-dimensional feature spaces, so measured is some hyperspectral data, and the true are, you know, so also quite, quite complicated, high-dimensional, and so we can't write down the likelihood P of measured given true. But uh, we have simulators, so we can sample from P of measured given true. And this gives rise to a type of machine learning called simulation-based or likelihood-free inference. OK, so I'll briefly show you one example, uh, just to give you a sense of how this works. Um, this is based on uh, reweighting. So reweighting is super common in high energy physics. I have you know, data set one sampled from P, data set two sampled from Q. I'd like to learn weights that morph data set um, one into data set two, and so the ideal weights would be Q over P, um, but the problem is that I don't know P, I don't know Q, and the way we get around this is that we use neural networks. So neural networks trained as classifiers are actually very efficient likelihood ratio estimation. So you train a classifier to distinguish samples from P and samples from Q, and you can interpret the output, the neural network uh, score, as um, a likelihood ratio. And it turns out this changes the problem of density estimation, that is estimating P and Q separately, which is hard, into the problem of estimating the ratio directly, which is easier. OK, um, and so yeah, this is um, very effective. We can learn likelihood ratios. Um, it's relatively simple to integrate complex um, data structures like symmetries of our data, um, variable number of, of particles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's complicated when you want to do it parameterized with a large number of parameters. This is just to say that it works. So here is an example where you have some E plus E minus uh, collisions, not unlike the ones that were talked about in the previous uh, talk, and reweighting the full phase space. So you reweight, you know, all the particles, all their four vectors, all their flavors um, from one data set to another, um, and it works very effectively. It's hard to visualize what that looks like. So here are just some one-dimensional projections. Uh, it doesn't matter so much what the features are, um, but the the blue is morphed into the um, into the black via the orange. And this is a very technical slide, but just to say that it works really well across the full phase space, even if you make very small changes or um, very delocalized changes. So for instance, like changing the fragmentation, the hadronization um, in Pythia, or changing like how often you get strange particles. And these methods work exceedingly well. Um, you can also parameterize the reweighting. Um, you can learn a classifier that sort of interpolates between different parameter values, in this case, the strong coupling constant. And this plot is to show that it, this works and it's very, very effective. Um, and you can also use these models to do inference. So I, I, I promised I wouldn't talk much about parameter estimation, but you can indeed use them for parameter estimation. Um, and basically, this is just say um, you can use these reweighting functions as, as surrogate models. And um, I'm going to skip um, this um, this slide. It basically just says how you can use these neural networks to do gradient descent, um, which is pretty great. You can imagine um, starting somewhere and then using this high dimensional neural network um, to take gradients and, and actually try to find the optimal values. All right, so the very last thing I'm going to talk about is this unfolding business. 
where uh, the usual approach is that we we project down our phase space into some low dimensional summary statistic, and then we make bins and a histogram, and then we go from the bottom left to the bottom right. And um, we do this with you know basically taking a matrix and inverting it. We know um, for each bin of the measured, or of the true, how it gives rise to a measured, we can invert that um, using various forms of regularized matrix inversion. But one possibility could be to optimize the detector level observables using neural networks. Here's a plot that shows that, that works um, pretty well. This is in the context of DIS, um, so not the LHC, but um, similar idea, where uh, these are traditional methods for reconstructing, um, say, um, the, the collision X. Um, and the right-hand side shows a neural network that sort of basically gets the best of both worlds. It interpolates very well. And the point is that for doing differential cross-section measurements, the particle level observable better be physically defined because you want to make calculations. But the detector level observable can be whatever you want it to be. And so you can design it to be tailored to match um, as good as possible given your detector. Um, an alternative strategy is to instead of tailoring your observable, is just unfold everything. Um, and this would be impossible to do without machine learning, but now is um, possible um, with different approaches. Uh, and basically, machine learning allows us to do unfolding unbind in high dimensions. And there are a number of proposals that for this. Uh, here are two compared. One is called Omnifold, which is based on reweighting, and one that's called CINN, which is based on neural normalizing flows. And they both work pretty well. And what's really what's shown here is that you can measure two-dimensional phase space, um, uh, and then you can easily get a cross-section measurement of their ratio, which is impossible if you do this with bins, because um, you have all sorts of discretization effects that just don't apply if you do this on bin. All right, so I cover a lot of ground in very little time. I try to give you um, a sense of uh, the breadth and depth of uh, machine learning for energy physics, giving some specific examples. And I hope I've made it clear that these tools have great potential um, to uh, um, further the science of energy physics across frontiers. There are applications now that were basically unthinkable before the deep learning revolution, and new ideas are still coming in very fast. Um, and we need everyone's help in order to um, develop and deploy these methods. Um, and I've given some specific examples today, but if you want to hear, see a, exclusive, uh, see a comprehensive list of applications, there's a living review that continuously grows with time. And with that, I will, I will end. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now open for some questions. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, now since machine learning techniques started becoming more com uh, better than the conventional techniques, I was just wondering, uh, are, they, are there efforts for applying them to legacy data, say from LIP or the Tevatron? So maybe there are uh, signals that we've missed or maybe more information that can be gleaned? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would say absolutely. Um, I'm personally involved in actually those, some of those efforts. Um, and uh, so, for example, the the example I gave here, I didn't explain it at all, but it's it's DIS, and and actually this is this example is from is from Hera, so we're you know we're reanalyzing Hera data um, uh, using the latest and greatest, in, in fact, this machine learning method, um, and um, I'm personally interested, and I know there are others who are interested in in um, using both measurement, new measurement, and search strategies to extract more information from from those old um, data sets. Um, and it's amazing, given the new insights that we have, how much we can still extract from these um, pristine data sets um, from before. OK. So my question is also related with that. And while doing the unfolding, how do you handle the covariance matrix? I mean, the systematics. How do you handle it? Right. So maybe I'll give the answer in the context of unbind unfolding. So. Um, uh, I mean, here there's nothing. There's nothing uh, special about doing it with a neural network. Um, so all the usual things still apply. Um, all the um, the usual um, setup is that you, know, you have a detector simulation that's accurate with the uncertainties, and so typically you vary the uncertainties to to see how that would affect the result. So you do the same thing here. It just requires some more computation than usual because it often requires training, you know, one or many uh, neural networks. Um, the complication arises when you want to know, say, method non closure. Um, uncertainties because it's harder to probe, you know, um, uh, in a high-dimensional space, like where where your biases are. Um, 
for standard experimental uncertainties, there's no problem. It's just the usual. You vary some aspect of the detector simulation and you, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, but uh, um, getting like model biases is a bit trickier, but still there are, there are techniques that can be used um, to do that. Uh, hi, Ben. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I also wanted to follow up on this aspect. So since there's anyway uh, in the field, a lot of discussion about how uncertainties will be handled with neural networks. So uh, I wanted to get your take overall on if we are going to use things like, uh, uh, you know, generative models or things like that. And then uh, how do we study biases that come in? And uh, how do we uh, assign uncertainties because of that, which we uh, which we have some techniques of doing for traditional methods. Yeah, in many cases, the uh, traditional method, the methods that we had for classical approaches, they apply here also. Um, so there's nothing super special. Like, in a sense, what I like to say is, you know, um, if you compute the invariant mass of, you know, say like a jet, that's a very complicated high dimensional nonlinear function, just like a neural network. The only difference is that you know you can write down a formula and it somehow makes makes us feel safer, um, but it's still quite complicated. But approaches that we have for propagating uncertainties in the usual ways those also apply. But um, that said, um, of course, it's more difficult to validate the performance in high dimensions. So the generative models I talked about, the surrogate models, the fast simulations, there is uh, I would say an open research question how to best validate them. We have some ideas um, uh, of how to like project down to low dimensions or do other tasks that allow us to check the quality of the um, of the simulations. But um, figuring out how to do that in a holistic way um, probably will require you know application specific solutions, um, and it's still an active area of R and D. Um, but in general, um, uh, you know, uncertainty quantification is is definitely a, a well studied and thought through process for machine learning in general. And in many cases, um, uh, I think the real concern is whether you're being optimal, not so much whether you're being biased, because we have really good approaches for estimating uncertainties using um, you know, complicated methods, classical, complicated classical methods. And you know, typically now, you know, if you're, let's say your simulation is a bit wrong when you train your classifier for a given task, that usually means you're going to be suboptimal, but not necessarily that you're going to have a wrong answer. I go. Hi, oh, it's a great talk. Uh, I just had a question, probably very unfair for you, but there's a lot of machine learning going on in collider operation and collider detector interface. So I wonder whether there's any crosstalk between those guys and you who is looking at data sets from the detectors and stuff. That, that would be good to know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if I just quickly go back to here, this picture, I, I said something about how machine learning can be used already you know, for experimental design or for like QA, QC, right? Um, or operations. And um, there is some crosstalk for sure. So one, I think fun area is in the area of anomaly detection. So anomaly detection can be used for finding new physics, but it can also be used for finding problems with detectors. And, you know, that's very similar techniques can be used for both of those cases. And in the latter case, it's you know something you know which will find a lot of anomalies and can be used online to help correct for them. Um, I'm personally interested in the context of um, experimental design, so using um, machine learning methods to the buzzword is co-design. So design a detector knowing how it will be used later, um, and um, uh, this is a, I think a very powerful tool that is not so useful for the LHC detectors because they already exist and aren't going to change that much in the future. But for future colliders or other experiments that are not at the LHC, or say some of the auxiliary experiments that are being proposed around the LHC complex, then these tools can be used for that case as well. So I see no further questions at the moment. So thank you very much, Benjamin.